Football goals have barely changed in shape or size in over 150 years. In a smoky London tavern in 1863, the newly formed Football Association dictated the distance between posts should be eight yards. Crossbars, marked eight foot above the ground, didn't become mandatory until 1882, with both Sheffield FC and Queen's Park simultaneously boasting to be the first club to install them. And even they were controversial from the start. In 1888, Kensington Swifts were disqualified for erecting two different sized goals in an FA Cup tie with Crew Alexandra. And a year later, Sheffield United's 24 stone goalkeeper, William Fatty Falk, broke his bar by overzealously swinging on it. The first net was used at the Kensington Oval in 1891, as Blackburn Rovers beat Notts County to win the FA Cup. And football has since seen goal frames evolve from wood to aluminium but the dimensions between the sticks have never been altered or ever been significantly scrutinised. Now this is quite surprising, considering that there was little or no science behind the goal's size. Goals most likely originated from those found in the Chinese sport of kickball. Zukui, as it's known today, hit its peak during the Song Dynasty, and was played with 33-foot-high goals with a one-foot hole in the centre and coloured rope nets. Scorers were rewarded with drum rolls and sometimes wine. And the first written reference to goals came from Cornish Hurling in 1602. Historian Richard Carew described them as the space between two bushes, about ten foot asunder or apart. Both these formative frames, in sports similar to football, were bigger than our modern ones, yet it took until 1996 to seriously question the size of goals. Now disgraced ex-FIFA president Sepp Blatter called for their diameter to be widened by 50 centimetres, or as he put it, two footballs and for their height to be increased by 25 centimetres. But uproar ensued, and the plan was shelved prior to any serious debate. But were bigger goals really such a bad idea? Well, the average height of a man in 1863 was 5 foot and 5 inches. Today, it's 5 foot and 9 inches. Of course, goalkeepers have, and always will, tower above those numbers. Based on available data, the average keeper height in English top-flight football in 1863 was 5 foot 10. By 1980, keepers had crept up to 6 foot, and now they stand at around 6 foot 3. The Bundesliga and Liga also field tall keepers, but intriguingly, Serie A and La Liga prefer their shot stoppers slightly shorter. Jose René Higuita, famous for his sensational scorpion kick save against England in 1995, Sergio Alvarez, David Ospina, Claudio Bravo, and Marc-André Ter Stegen are just some examples of keepers with stints in Spain or Italy who are well below 6 foot 3. Superficially, the rise of colossal keepers does correlate with a decline in goals. Between 1863 and 1980, when 6 foot keepers first became commonplace, the average number of goals per game in the English top flight was 3.42, and that number has since dropped to 2.65. And the pattern is the same in Europe's other big leagues. Once the average keeper height surpassed six foot in France, Germany, Italy and Spain at all slightly different times, average goals per game also declined. So, at face value, it seems the days of Everton's Dixie Dean scoring 60 league goals in a single season are over. And we will probably never see another tournament like the 1954 World Cup in Switzerland where there was an average of over five goals per game including a 7-5 thriller as the hosts lost to Austria in the quarterfinals. The goalkeepers present then had an average height of 5 foot 11, with England's number 2 Ted Burgin just 5 foot 7. In contrast, there was a record low 115 goals at Italia 90, and the average keeper there was closer to 6 foot 2. Now these stats suggest that bigger keepers must be housed in bigger goals or the decline in scoring will continue. But here's the twist. By digging a little deeper, it actually reveals short keepers aren't at a disadvantage and in fact concede less than very tall ones. Last season, across Europe's big five leagues, goalkeepers saved around 7 out of 10 shots on target, but keepers 6 foot 1 and under performed above average, while those over 6 foot 4 had a strikingly poorer record. Bournemouth's Asmir Begovic conceded a goal for almost every save that he made while Dijon's Bobby Alain saved an average of nearly four shots before being beaten. Other short keepers who outperformed taller ones include Deportivo Alaves' Fernando Pacheco and Atletico Madrid's Jan Oblak. Real Madrid's Thibaut Courtois and Bayern Munich's Manuel Neuer had below par seasons, with the German shipping 22 goals in just 26 appearances. Now, of course, there are lots of variables that warp these stats. 
After all, goalies might be the last gatekeeper, but they are still reliant on the defenders in front of them. They are not at fault for every goal, nor is every save equal. The stats may count each save as so, but a full stretch fingertip around the post to prevent a surefire goal is clearly more valuable than countless simple stops. But the plot nonetheless thickens when different areas of the goal are isolated. Since the inception of the Premier League in 1992, 61% of the 26,786 goals scored occurred in the bottom corners, with a far smaller percentage, 13%, in the top corners. Keepers, 6 foot 4 and over, presumably struggling to get down in time despite their longer reach, conceded 2,414 more bottom corner goals than keepers 6 foot 1 and under. And as you might expect, smaller goalies struggled up high, conceding 696 more times. Now, the Premier League's worst keepers at defending the bottom corners are ex Arsenal, Aston Villa, and Reading goalie Stuart Taylor, and former Wolves and current Crystal Palace number no. 1 Wayne Hennessy. But the truth is, you could just as easily argue that if keepers continue to rise, but can't get down low quick enough, then goals should actually be smaller. Women's football further backs up that shorter goalkeepers are not at a disadvantage. The average keeper height at this summer's Women's World Cup was 5 foot 7, England's Karen Bardsley was the tallest at 6 foot, and Brazil's Aline Villares Rice, the shortest at 5 foot 4. The 52 games in France averaged 2.81 goals, the same tally as in Canada four years earlier. 13 came in one game, as Megan Rapinoe's USA thrashed Thailand. The other 51 games saw 2.61 goals, a figure in keeping with the men at Russia 2018. So if size doesn't really matter, what other than better defending is actually causing this scoring decline? Well, firstly, it's important to note that goal tallies have always fluctuated, so the averages shouldn't be taken out of context. Using England's top flight as a case study, the average currently sits well below 3, which is historically quite low, but the most popular scorelines since 1863 are still 1-0 and 1-1. They account for over 20% of all results. 2-1 and 0-0 are also very common. Temporary goal spikes, or more recently lulls, which distort the overall average, are often triggered by rule changes. In 1925, FIFA amended the offside rule, allowing two, not three players, to be between an attacker and the goal. There was an instant and dramatic increase in scoring, from over two to almost four goals per game. By 1958, substitutions were introduced, originally for injured players only, and goals started drying up in the decade that followed, perhaps because there were 11 fit players on the field. Ever-changing tactics also affect scoring. In 1981, wins were rewarded with three points instead of two. There was suddenly more incentive to attack, and this led to a temporary surge in goals. But since then, it's possible the opposite has happened, and top teams who score first park the bus a little bit more. Elite defenders are trusted more than ever, and winning is simply more important than entertaining. And of course, there are obvious exceptions. Manchester City won the 2013-14 and 17-18 Premier League titles, scoring a combined total of 208 goals. Chelsea also eclipsed a century of goals in 2009-10. But Manchester United won the inaugural Premier League crown with just 67 goals. Arsenal's Invincibles may have gone unbeaten, but scored only 73 times. And Leicester City's miracle title win was masterminded by defenders Wes Morgan and Robert Huth, and a counter-attacking style with only 68 goals at the other end. Going forwards, it will be intriguing to see whether the use of video assistant referees changes the scoring equilibrium. Either way, technology, other rule changes and ever-evolving tactics are clearly affecting scoring. But as for our goal frames, whether through luck or judgement, they've remained the perfect size for both sexes since the very start. Making them bigger would obviously restore the original intended ratio between goal size and keeper height, but it wouldn't necessarily lead to an increase in scoring.